Okay, time to get started. So here's where we were last time. We uh, had talked about uh, triple integrals, uh, the definition, the intuition, how they connect to applications, uh, claims about how they relate to um, iterated integrals, and in particular how you find bounds in non-rectangular domains. So we covered a tremendous amount of sort of uh, you know abstract stuff um, super quickly because, of course, it's just like double integrals. Same idea, just three-dimensional instead of two-dimensional. Other than that, it's pretty much the same. So, uh, again, the, the challenge with triple integrals tends to be the geometry of it all. Uh, how do I understand the domain well enough to be able to go through and slice it up and actually figure out those bounds? And uh, you'll recall that uh, my, my big argument for how to do this in general is... Um, <clears throat> for any given bound you're trying to figure out, so for example, when we're trying to figure out this bound right here, you know, how do I know that that's 1 minus x? Okay, well, we're looking at the upper bound for y after having fixed x. So x is fixed. Uh, we are uh, looking for the upper bound for y. That's going to be that point. Uh, about which we happen to also know, in addition to the fact that we know x, we also know that it's on that face, a.k.a. the plane that has this equation. And we also know, thank you, diagram, got to have the diagram for this. I can see from the diagram that it is on that face, a.k.a. the plane with that equation. And so this is the algebra that you solve for y, because, of course, we're looking for a y bound. Uh, and what you get when you solve for y is that upper bound. Right? So remember the process. The process is what's important here. The example, one could argue, nah, it's not that hard. Right? But the process is important. Okay, so moving along. So um, <clears throat> a couple of non-surprising uh, statements. Here, uh, carryovers, arguably, from the double integrals business. Try not to slice through corners. Right? Morally, the same reason as for double integrals. It's just going to mess up the, the, the outer integral. You're going to have to break it up into two chunks. It's just nobody wants this, right? So if at all possible, to the extent possible, try not to slice through corners uh, in, you know, in the middle of your slicing process. Um, and then also think about uh, which variable is uh, more naturally a function of the others and let that guide you in terms of which order you do the differentials. Um, so uh, just like with double integrals. Now, the next one is a bit new. Um, <clears throat> technically, there's a version of this in 2D, but you don't really need it. This is a very useful technique in triple intervals. And it uh, concerns what I'm going to call projections. And I'm going to try to suggest, I'm not going to be rigorous about this. This is just strategy, so we don't have to be rigorous. But there is uh, what I'm going to call a good projection. And rather go rather than going through this uh, discussion right here out of context, I'm going to come back to it as we go through this example. Um, <clears throat> so uh, first let's understand what the example is asking. Uh, we have um, this region right here. You can see I've drawn a kind of a sort of a picture of it. Uh, about like that. That's our our solid that we're interested in. So for whatever reason, we're doing a triple integral over this solid. Again, don't worry about why. Maybe we're computing mass. Maybe we're computing population. It doesn't matter. We have a triple integral. That's given. Okay. So what to do, right? Uh, how are we going to go about We've got six different ways that we can slice. How should we decide? And I think a pretty good, easy observation is you see that z is uh, much more naturally a function of x and y than any of the other options. I could solve for x. Then I have square roots in my bounds, which means I'm eventually going to have square roots in my integrand. Nobody wants this. right? So I, th this kind of suggests then uh, that I ought to put my dz on the inside where I would need to solve for it in terms of x and y, again, which I am not scared of. 
right? So this is my least worst option. So that, that argues that. Now, by process of elimination, that kind of argues that your dx and your dy should be on the app side. So we're going to go with that. And now I'm going to say, let's set aside this business about um, which is a function of what. Let's just suppose and presume that we're going to put dx, dy on the outside. And let's try to see how we can capitalize on this geometrically. Uh, how is there some trick that'll help us visualize what's going on? And I say that there is. So here's a big idea. dx and dy are on the outside. Look in the xy plane. Look at the shadow, what I like to call the shadow. Uh, of your solid down in said xy plane identified by, again, which differentials you're putting on the outside. And then I make the uh, modest observation that as I slice up this solid, right, with keeping in mind dx and dy on the outside, I'll be slicing first perpendicular to the y-axis, and then those I'll be slicing perpendicular to the x-axis, and very conveniently, the x's and y's for the points that are in my solid are exactly the same as the x's and y's for the points in the shadow. That's the big observation. After all, when you project directly downward from anywhere in this solid, doesn't matter, anywhere in this solid, down into the xy plane, you're basically just throwing away the z coordinate. The x's and y's are exactly the same. So the big, the big trick here, then, I suppose that I could, you know, as y goes across, uh, and as I look at my uh, uh, my y slices, uh, I could think about. What do these slices look like and where is the first and last? But you can already see it's getting pretty hard to draw, right? The art's getting to be a little challenging here. Ooh, that's a tough one. Okay, but you don't need to because you can just as well look at the slices on the shadow. Much easier to see, much easier to draw. I don't even need, really need to do this on this three-dimensional picture. I could draw just the XY plane alone. Two-dimensional picture, super easy to see, super easy to slice up and, you know, do business. So I can see the bounds for my Y integral just by looking at the shadow. I don't need to look at the solid. Uh, <clears throat> huge observation. And with, now with that noted, uh, let's look then at any given one of my Y slices. Uh, let's see now again, I'm going to look at my two alternatives here. Right, I've got my actual Y slice, I've got my shadow Y slice. And again, the X and Y coordinates are the same. So in particular, the X coordinates that I want to find the range of on this actual Y slice are exactly the same as the X coordinates on this shadow Y slice. So rather than looking at, uh, okay, you know, here's uh, my first x slice, blah, 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 and here's my last x slice, I can much more conveniently just say, all right, well, we've got that point, and then we've got that point. All the same x coordinates. Okay, so this is really, really nice. Uh, again, the nice punchline is I don't have to look at that picture up there at all. I can just look at the shadow in the xy plane. Because I'm because I've decided X and Y are going to be the outside differentials, I look at the shadow in the XY plane. That shadow is easy. It's just a quarter disk. That gives rise to these bounds. I didn't have to slice up my solid at all. It's a good trick. I'm a big fan. Okay, now what about those inside bounds? All right, there is the, <clears throat> the little matter of the inside bounds. Uh, <clears throat> the inside bounds, now keep in mind, we decided we were going to put Z on the inside, right, DZ. So I need to know for one of these XY slices, I need to know what's the starting value of Z and the ending value of Z. Okay, next cool observation about this projection. Having chosen 
to put X and Y on the outside. Therefore, having chosen to project vertically, my XY slice itself is going to be vertical. My lower bound for Z is just going to be that bottom point. And that bottom point, got to love it, is always on the same surface. It's always on that paraboloid. That's a good thing, right? That's very convenient. That means that if I want to know this bottom bound for Z, I just need to look at that bottom surface and solve for Z in that bottom surface, which of course is easy in this case. Now what about this top point uh, up here? Let's look at the, uh, the top point here. That top point, well again, good news, that top point is always on that top surface. So again, I just need to solve for Z in that top surface easy to do. Uh, yeah? Where did you get the upper bound for GX, the square root of 1 minus the last thing? Yeah, that comes from uh, this curve right here, because that's the curve that that point is on. And uh, that curve comes from this curve. That curve comes from where these two surfaces intersect. And if you take these two equations and combine them, like I did here, then uh, you, I, I forgot who asked me this question. I'm sorry. So yes, uh, then uh, you get the uh, equation of a unit circle, and then it's just solve for x. Yeah. Is that cool? I, I did kind of skip over that because it's basically a double integral argument. But yeah, that's that's cool. Okay. All right. Okay, so uh, this worked out really, really nicely. Uh, let me talk through what made this work so well. And I claim it's what I have here. It's because this is what I like to call a good uh, projection. And let's see, I think I can get all this uh, onto the screen uh, all at once. I call this a good projection because the shadow that told me my outside bounds is a reasonable shape that I don't mind working with. You know, all else being equal, uh, I like it when things are rectangles, <laughs> but I mean, uh, this didn't work out all that bad, right? So I'm going to call that a good shadow. That's the first thing we want. Um, the second thing is I want the bottom and top surfaces to be nice. So the bottom surface, again, is this one. It tells me my lower bound. It's consistently always that surface, right? It's not like, oh, well, the bottom bound for Z is going to be one surface kind of over on this side, and the, but it's a different surface on the other side. No, it's always this one surface described by one equation, right? And it's not even that bad of an equation. And then likewise, the top surface. Uh, let's see, I'm running out of good colors. I guess I'll use red. The top surface. Uh, let's see, I guess I... Huh? bottom was that one. The top surface that tells me where the upper bound for Z is also always the same surface for every point in my shadow. And again, desirable, looks good, nice easy equation, nothing to it. So this is what I mean by a good projection. Basically a projection where the particulars work out desirably nicely like this. And uh, you'd be surprised how often uh, a good projection uh, is identifiable and really simplifies your problem. So I have several more examples. And now uh, these, uh, each one of these examples, you can think about it in the usual way by taking slices and then taking slices of slices and stuff like that. But it gets hard to draw. And I think you'll find my projection trick to be a, a nice workaround in these cases. So let's start with uh, the unit ball. Uh, here's our uh, domain. Right, I want to do a triple integral on the unit ball. Again, don't worry about the application. Um, whatever it is we're computing, uh, this is the triple integral that represents it. And we want to focus on the second part, namely how to turn that into an iterated integral. So um, you can slice it up. Um, we could slice first, for example, in the x direction. 
negative one to one, perpendicular to which I get slices that look like that, which look like this. And by the way, uh, <clears throat> harder to draw than you would expect. Give it a try if you don't believe me. It's tricky, surprisingly tricky to draw a sphere and then slices of the sphere. It's, uh, it's weird. So uh, that's what those slices look like. And then I can talk about slices perpendicular to the z-axis, namely setting values of z. Uh, those slices being something that looks like this and thinking about the points where they start and end. And you can see the picture's getting tricky, right? Hard to draw. So that's one option, and you can play it through that way. And, and you know, just as a, uh, if only for the practice, I think it is a healthy exercise. To, yeah, play this through. See how you like it. I don't think you're going to like it as much, right? Um, on the other hand, much easier. Noticing that we've got X and Z on the outside, let's just think about what is the projection of this ball into the XZ plane. And that's a relatively easy question. Um, it's just a matter of uh, realizing that the shadow is just a disk. Like that. It's a unit disk. I could draw a merely two-dimensional picture of that unit disk and play double integral games and not hard to persuade yourself that the resulting bounds will be this just thinking about the unit disk in the XZ plane so we're two-thirds of the way done and we barely even had to think about the three-dimensional picture right pretty nice um, <clears throat> that being said, then uh, our inside variable is y, which means I want to look at the starting values of y, the ending values of y, or said differently, I need to find the uh, left surface, which is just part of the sphere, and the right surface, which is the other half of the sphere. Right, and again, not that much to it in the picture drawing aspects of that. Right? Pretty straightforward. And I'd, so I just need to solve. Now, again, I, the picture does uh, explain uh, the last little detail. I mean, both of these surfaces, the start surface and the end surface, they are both the same sphere. They do have the same equation. So how do I know when I solve for y, do I want the plus or do I want the minus? Um, well, the green one, where y is clearly negative. The orange one is where y is clearly positive, and that guides those selections. And that's how you know that it's the negative square root for the lower bound, and it's the positive square root for the upper bound. Much easier, much less geometrically challenging, in my opinion. So it's a nice little, uh, nice little hack, nice little trick. Everybody with me? Next example is a weird one. <clears throat> um, this is a mm, kind of a sleeper. It doesn't look that bad because you know, at a quick glance, you're like, "Oh gosh, look how convenient! It's only planes. I'm not going to have to do any hard algebra on this. I'm not going to have to complete any squares or anything like that." And that's true. What is hard about this is looking at the equations of five planes understanding how those planes sort of cut through space and then figuring out what is the solid that is bounded by those five planes. That is geometrically very challenging in general. And uh, if these were five random planes, it would be imp impractical. Uh, certainly wouldn't be a fair question in a, in a course like this. So um, <clears throat> what makes this problem doable is that these are not five random planes. There is a really clever little foot in the door that y'all can capitalize on uh, in, in very often, I don't want to say always, but in questions when you have clearly some fairly pleasant, you know, not that bad looking planes uh, in here. Um, in this case, the foot in the door is to notice that three of these <coughs> excuse me, um, equations have no y's in them. 
and now flashbacks to first week of class, one of the uh, neat observations we made is that there's no y in the equation. That means that it's parallel to the y-axis. And knowing that, <coughs> oh gosh, excuse me. Mm. Knowing that makes these planes actually pretty easy to draw. I can just think about what they look like in the xz plane first. These are just lines in the xz plane. Nothing to it. Once you see what it looks like in the xz plane, knowing that they're parallel to the y-axis, then I can just kind of do like this and just kind of drag it out you know, in the y direction. And I can pretty quickly see that these three planes, ignoring the other two, we'll get to the other two in a second, these three planes just kind of make a prism. Everybody see that? Okay. All right, so all that remains then is to figure out what's going on with these other planes. Uh, y equals zero is a pretty easy one. That's uh, this plane right here. It's the XZ plane itself. Now you have to use your three-dimensional imagination and ask how does this XZ plane here, how does that cut through our prism? And, you know, no problem. It just uh, cuts through uh, to make this kind of triangular left face. Uh, right there, right? And now the uh, the admittedly challenging one, this one I have in orange now, ah, and that's not parallel to any of the coordinate axes. All right, so we're going to have to think about normal vectors and stuff. So notice that the normal vector here is 1, 1, 1. So the normal vector is kind of coming out of the, of the, of the screen kind of like this. Right, uh, and so it is the first drawing I would make of this. Frankly, is probably about like this. Right. Alternatively, you can think about where does it intersect the x, y, and z axes. It intersects those axes at three on each of the axes. And now again, you, know, you got to think geometrically and use your geometric imagination and intuition. How does this uh, orange plane, how does that cut through the prism? And, well, it's going to be something kind of like that. Is that cool? All right. All right. Okay, so now we know what our solid looks like. Um, <clears throat> tricky to see what that solid looks like. Uh, having noted that... Um, uh, a nice exercise that I want you all to do on your own. I'm not going to do it because I'm going to show you the better way to solve this problem, right? But if you do want to slice up the solid, the only way that you can slice up this solid without hitting corners is if you do your differentials in this and only this order. So, you know, for example, uh, let's suppose that I decide I want to do instead, if I were to foolishly uh, say, okay, well, I'm going to do... Um, you know, uh, dz, dy, dx. And let's think about what my x slices look like. Well, my x slices are going to look kind of like this. Uh, I don't know, something like that maybe. Right? Already hard to draw. I'm not happy. <laughs> right? But notice you're going to hit this corner. Right? As x goes from its lowest to its highest, you are going to slice through a corner. You are going to have problems. Not good. Uh, and uh, likewise, if you were to go in uh, a different order, if you were to do your dy slicing first, let's suppose you were to put dy on the outside. Well, your slices look like this until you hit this corner. And then later, this corner... And again, things get all messed up. Uh, <clears throat> you, know, you really don't want to do that that way. It's super inconvenient. Okay. All right, so think through all your other options. Persuade yourself, please. This is your only slicing option. Okay, now, that said, let's think instead about projections. What, is there a nice, as discussed previously, is there a desirable projection here? Which way would I project to make things good? Now, you might uh, <clears throat> hope that you could project down to the XY plane or something. Uh, it doesn't look that bad at first uh, because uh, that's just a, uh, what 
they call it a trapezoid. Uh, anyway, it's, it's not a scary shape. That seems fine. The problem is that the upper bound surface has two chunks. Um, and in particular, for these points in the shadow, it's this face that gives you your upper bound for Z. Whereas, <coughs> instead, if you were to look at these points in the shadow, then it's this back face that is your upper bound for Z. So, <coughs> not good. Right? So what we have here is that this uh, the upper uh, the upper bound surface there is not consistent, and that makes this not a good projection. Everybody see that? And you know, try other directions, and again, you're going to be disappointed in uh, various different ways. Um, so um, here's the good one. The good one is to project into the xz plane. You project into the XZ plane. Again, this projection itself is, uh, you know, fine, whatever. That's, you know, no problem. We know how to deal with that. So if I put XZ on the outside, we can slice that up. No trouble. Details. Double integral details, basically. So make sure you can fill in those blanks. And then notice my lower bound surface is always where Y equals zero. And then my upper bound surface is always that face, which has uh, the, that other equation, which again, when you solve for y, gives you that for your upper bound. So much less artistically challenging. Uh, didn't slice through any corners. Uh, no problems. Nice and smooth. Is everybody happy with that? All right, so it's a great tool. Uh, <clears throat> last example, uh, this is just another example about how projections are great. Um, you could probably, oh yeah, question. I just want to ask, uh, yeah. when the shape, what corner doesn't allow you to use DZ first? Uh, DZ for, oh, we are using DZ first. Or the, uh, Oh yeah, dy is the bad one. If I were to put y on the outside, and if I were to imagine slicing, you know, uh, perpendicular to that, um, I hit two different corners. I hit this corner and that corner. And that gives me three different shapes of cross sections. My cross sections look like that over there. Okay, can I draw it? Uh, then they look like uh, that there, and then they look like. Uh, about like that there so three separate integrals that's yeah that's the worst one <laughs> okay. is, that, is that cool yeah i yeah. wanted to see what the like, oh yeah it's and and <clears throat> isn't it nice that we don't have to worry about that yeah <laughs> so the projection trick saves us uh saves us that worry okay good 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 okay yeah so last example um, I think it kind of leaps off the page pretty well that we want to project this way. Uh, because if we project in that direction, notice that our lower bound surface is always that paraboloid right there. In which solving for y is not a problem, right? y is going to be the inside variable if I project to xz. Y is the inside variable. Solve for Y. Good. I was hoping to solve for Y. That's that's sweet, right? And then the upper bound surface is going to be that, which is this paraboloid. So it, it, the projection works out really well in the XZ direction. Now, it's not that you can't do it other ways. It's just that it's unfortunate if you do it other ways. So I guess you could argue that uh, the projection in the XY plane... Oh, God. Okay, uh, I'm going to try to draw this. Um, no, try it again. Uh, 
Something like that. I don't really like it. It's hard to draw off nothing else. <laughs> right? But then also, um, here's what's worse. Uh, for some of these points in this XY projection, like for these points down here, then uh, my top surface is, oh gosh, uh, my top surface is that thing, right? And bottom surface, whew, man, this is a hard one. Bottom surface is that, right? But then for other points in that projection, if I look up this kind of finger, right, then, oh God, there's kind of this terrible thing happening where there's, there's solid above that, and then way down here, there's also solid below that that's uh, hard to draw. And so it's just all sorts of nightmares if you go in that other direction. So anyway, try not to... Uh, uh, try to make the best possible choice when you're thinking about which direction to project. Okay. So uh, that noted, uh, here's our projection. Uh, it's defined by its boundary, which comes from this intersection, which is where both of these surfaces intersect, and therefore uh, setting y1 equal to y2, I get this equation describing my, my bound. Um, <clears throat> and that equation for that curve very conveniently gives me these bounds. Double integral slicing. Now, again, I'm skipping over those details, right? But if you take this, uh, this equation, describing that circle in the xz plane, if you slice it up, you will get these as your bounds. And then, again, very conveniently, the lower bound surface is consistently just that one, and the upper bound surface is consistently that one. So real easy to, uh, to follow through from the projection point of view. Yeah? Uh, so my question is, like, would it be possible to like, turn this into, like, uh, if you look at it just from the YZ plane, would it, could you turn it into like, a single variable calc 2 problem where you just like, rotate it to find the off volume, or is that not possible? To do? If we were computing volume, you could, but we're not computing volume. We're computing a triple interval, right? And so uh, I, now here, here's what I think happened. I could be wrong, right? But I think you fell victim to the trap that I was talking about last time, uh, which is, uh, oh gosh, I need glasses to see where the thing is. Uh, which is, um, I was pointing out that it's real easy to conflate, right, these two different pictures that kind of at a glance look the same, and sometimes this is about volume, and sometimes it's about something else. You see what I'm saying? Right? So, so very importantly, what we're interested in on this question, we're not interested in volume at all. That's, that's a different point of view on a different kind of integral. That's just not what we're doing. We're interested in computing a triple integral, meaning that there is some quantity that's accumulating over this interior, and it's that quantity that we're interested in. And even though the shape that we were looking at might, you know, is rotationally symmetric, the density might not be. Is that, is that cool? Yeah. All right. Yeah, I know. Very tempting. Very tempting. A lot of students get stuck on that. Uh, so that's a great question. Um, anybody else? Yes? Yeah. So right here you're doing dzx. Is it also possible to do dx? Oh, yeah. That's right. That's so the same thing, right? Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's neither one is any better than the other. You, you could totally... Change your bounds. Yeah, that's, gonna, that's right. The micro changes to, to these bounds. But yeah. Um, correct. Okay, so that's what we're going to do for triple integrals. Um, uh, lots of examples uh, are, uh, are in your future in the homework exercises. And give yourself plenty of practice. Make sure you sort of think through the methods. Again, I, this is all, the following is always true. I don't say it every time because, you know, uh, we only have so much time. But uh, remember, when you're doing homework exercises, when you're doing anything in this course, it's not about the answer. Right? It's about the reasoning and the process. So for each one of the homework exercises, think about what was the point of this story. What, how does the process discussed in class manifest itself in this example, in the solution to this example? Right? And make sure you understand the, uh, the, the reasoning 
and uh, such. Okay, on to 5.5. .5. Quick flashback. I know you all know this formula right here. This is just the substitution rule written as an equation. So you've definitely seen this before. Uh, very often the substitution rule is written not so much as an equation, but just as a, hey, look, you can do the following. It's like a, a, a method or something, right? Uh, and very often they do it for uh, antiderivatives instead of integrals. Here I'm very in particular using integrals, so there are bounds on these, uh, on these integrals. Okay, but I hopefully, presumably, y'all have uh, seen these before. So what I want to do is take a different point of view on the substitution rule. I know you know the substitution rule, right? Different point of view. I want to think of this as relating to not just an algebraic formula called G that we play algebraic games with. Right? I want to think of G as being something that we're visualizing geometrically that literally is taking an interval on the t-axis and turning it instead into an interval on the x-axis. So t goes in, x comes out. That means if I put a bunch of t's in, then I get a bunch of x's out. Okay. And uh, in particular, of course, you'll notice that uh, the range of values of t when plugged into this g function tells you the range of values of x. Okay. So there's two aspects of this picture that I want to focus on in particular. Um, <clears throat> one is this idea of a pullback. Um, so in particular, when you've decided what you want to call your g function, right? once you've set that g, very importantly, this integral here is something we can turn into that integral there. It kind of goes backwards. The function g itself goes to the right. t are the inputs, x are the outputs. But what's the way you would use that function in a substitution rule uh, example is that you would turn an integral written in terms of x into an integral written in terms of t. The plugging in makes it go backwards. Now, I want to point out, this is not some mysterious phenomenon peculiar to the substitution rule. This is, a, this is really uh, generic. And so let's think about a, just a plain old algebra example. Let's think about the function. Uh, if I have, um, uh, uh, let's see here, uh, uh, g of t uh, is uh, t cubed, let's say, and let's call that x. Let's suppose that that's my function, right, like this. t is an input, x is an output, and now let's just think about, just uh, forget about integrals, let's just think about some expression, like, uh, like sine x. What happens if I plug this in? This is just algebra, this is like algebra 2, maybe, right? This is not hard algebra basic high school algebra, and the act of plugging this in, everywhere I have an x, I instead get t cubed, and the result then is that this turns into an expression of t, sine of t cubed. So <clears throat> this idea of a pullback is not deep water. <laughs> this is just, uh, yeah, when you plug in, the, these turn into those. And just notice the arrow goes the other way. That's the big point here. Is that cool? All right. Um, <clears throat> so the second thing I want to point out is this idea of a stretching factor. Uh, this um, is, a again, a point of view you don't have to take, but it's going to be very helpful for us to take this point of view. Uh, and it uh, is based on the following observation. If I look at a little piece of the t-axis here, some little piece of the t-axis of size, let's call it dt, and if I ask, well, what does this function do to that, right, this function, g, is going to take all of those and it's going to turn them into uh, these other points over here. We're going to get a little interval over here on the x-axis of size dx. 
And let's just ask, are these the same size? Or if not, how are they different in size? And I'm going to flash us back to chapter 2, way back when. Right? And we were talking about how to think about derivatives. All derivatives you can think of in the following way. They relate input changes to output changes. right? And we started this conversation by thinking of dt as a size. But you can also think of dt as a change. It's how much t changes from the left side of this interval to the right side of that interval. So think of dt as an input change, dx as an output change, right? and then the factor, the relationship between input changes and output changes is the derivative. And this is what I'm going to call the stretching factor. I'm going to call it the stretching factor because it tells you how to relate. Now let's go back to thinking of this as a size again the relationship between the input size and the output size. And when you take something small and you turn it into something bigger, we like to think of it that it's been stretched. Right? So the derivative here, don't think of this as an algebraic sort of formality that uh, that's just how algebra works. Think of this derivative as being a geometric thing. It's how much did my intervals get stretched out. That's the term stretching factor. Is that okay? Is that All right, so cool. Uh, just a you know a different twist on the substitution rule, and this now being a multivariable calculus class, I just want to copycat that exact idea from single variable calculus in a multivariable context. All right, so I want to I want to come up with now a two dimensional version of the substitution rule. And okay, all right, so here we go. Uh, it's really not that big a deal uh, if I have a function with now two input variables and two output variables, right? Then I could talk about uh, some domain over here in the, the UV, I'm going to call the left side the UV plane. And I could ask, well, what's its image? Over here on the right-hand side, the xy plane, and I notice I'm not <laughs> I'm not assuming anything nice about this g function. This could be all kinds of weird. Doesn't have to be linear. It could be all twisty and turny and curvy and stuff. Right. So the image is going to be a very different shape, possibly bent, distorted. Right. So recovering. The idea of the pullback, when I do this, an integral defined on the xy plane, I would expect to turn into, pull back into an integral on the uv plane. And here's the, the, big, the big takeaway here, why this is awesome. If I find myself having to do an integral on this contorted, bent, twisted shape, I have now the potential to turn that instead into an integral on a much nicer shape, possibly a rectangle. And this is, this is so powerful. This is crazy powerful. Um, I can take nasty domains that I would hate um, like, I mean, let's just for fun, just, just for uh, the, the perverse fun of it all, let's think about how we would slice up this shape right here. And, uh, well, I guess I would have to, I would hit this corner, which means I would have to do that region separately. And then I would hit this corner, which means I would have to do that. And then I would hit this corner. Oh, my gosh. I would have, I believe, here, one, two, three, four separate slices. That's, that looks terrible, right? So not something I want to do. And by the way, it'd be comparably bad if I went in the other in the other uh, direction. Let's see here. Oh, there we go. Okay, so pullback would be awesome, and something that we're hoping we can make work out. Um, there's really not much to actually doing it. Keeping in mind that if x and y are functions of u and v. We can literally plug that in. X and Y are literally 
the G functions of U and V. Just plug it in. Up to it. It's sweet. The only other thing we have to worry about is the stretching factor. So, you know, we do have uh, <coughs> different chunks here, right? My little, my little chunk of the UV plane over here, this little, uh, you know, how big is that du dv uh, versus, on the other hand, what does that turn into over here in the xy plane? Well, it's going to turn into, oh uh, gosh, uh, something, probably not a rectangle, mind you. Right? Again, this g function could be all kinds of weird. Right? So things are going to get kind of bent and twisted, but because of the uniformity, um, uh, another way to say this, because multivariable functions are well approximated by their derivatives, and derivatives are matrices, and matrices are linear, even if G is not linear, the derivative is, and so I should expect this would be pretty similar to a parallelogram. Not a rectangle, but still should be close to a parallelogram. So what's the, uh, what's the, how big is this thing? Well, there's going to be some factor. There will be some stretching factor, I'm going to call it, that will tell me how much this gets stretched out by the function g. And uh, we're going to write down what that is in a couple seconds here. So uh, all together then, though, notice what we have is a strategy for turning Integrals that I don't want to have to deal with, right? This is an unhappy integral that's got uh, curved edges and corners galore, and this is a nightmare of an integral, right? And I can pull it back, though, into now a much happier integral that's, uh, that's over a rectangle, right? No problem. I would much rather compute the integral on the left than the integral on the right. Everybody on board? Okay, so that's going to be cool if we can pull it off. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, assert what this stretching factor is now. Um, this stretching factor uh, is uh, given by this formula here. Uh, why this is the right formula is, oh gosh, um, it's a computation that we're going to have to do later. Uh, but I, I could do this computation now. We have the tools. It's not a problem per se, but there's so much other stuff going on. Um, my idea is that let, let's, let's get some wins under our belt first. Let's actually crank some out, see what the mechanical process is. Let's get comfortable with this this whole strategy first, and then uh, once we have a good feel for change of variables, then we'll come back and address the question of uh, where did this formula come from. For, so for the moment, I'm just going to assert that that's the formula. And uh, just to be clear uh, as to uh, what that is, uh, don't forget the uh, derivative matrix uh, is the matrix of partial derivatives. Right, that we're t therefore um, subsequently taking a determinant of and then subsequently taking an absolute value of. By the way, easy to forget. Make sure not to forget that this is an absolute value of that determinant. That's important. Um, and uh, then uh, one other little quick little notational hack that is uh, actually really nice and I encourage um, <clears throat> this determinant here on the inside. The thing whose absolute value is the stretching factor, very importantly, you still have to take the absolute value. right? But I just want to talk about what's on the inside first. We use this notation right here uh, to represent uh, that determinant of the derivative matrix. And the reason why is because of how lovely the notation works out. If I rewrite the stretching factor as partial xy, partial uv, motivated by the fact that that's what this matrix is. This matrix is the partials of x and y with respect to u and v. Right? It's a pretty believable notation. And if I write this as uh, partial xy, uh, partial uv, note it's almost as if 
Uh, let's see here. I guess I better do it like this. It's almost as if those cancel. They don't. But it's as if they do, uh, and that then this, uh, you know, the, the dx, dy in the xy plane uh, is uh, is what uh, results. Now, that, that is absolute garbage nonsense. There is no cancellation. This is not a fraction. That's all nonsense garbage. I confess to that, right? But it's awful handy. It's very convenient. And uh, it also is going to uh, help us keep track of certain things about organization uh, at a certain point that we're not going to get to today since we're out of time. So uh, we will draw the line right here and pick up here on Monday. Y'all have a great weekend. See ya. And don't forget about attendance. If you didn't get marked down already, uh, make sure to get marked down.